more evidence is mounting for the very surprising discovery of these unusual IgG4 antibodies that are seen only in those who took the mRNA shots. And today I wanted to present to you a really surprising theory that might explain as to why this is being observed. And the surprise behind this is, is that the same reasons why we might have been observing the cytokine storm in unvaccinated who were getting infected with the virus and getting the COVID-19 disease, the same reason might be now responsible for production of these IgG4 antibodies in those who took the mRNA shots. My name is Dr. Mikhail Arashik of Genomics. Let's get started. Listen, this is going to be a very complicated story, so you have to stay with me. And how did it come about? I'm part of this group of scientists where I'm kind of more like a fly on the wall, where I have the privilege to listen to their genius discussions. And this group of scientists, they're primarily driven by observing what is, how, why is this IgG4 increase of these antibodies post mRNA sh shots? Why is this happening? So therefore, like, how can we explain this? And is it good or bad? And this group, the tendency seems to be leaning towards it might be dangerous, it might be bad, and therefore also what the group is involved, uh, involved in is what can we do about it to make sure that the population stays protected so that there, no harm comes to the population just because these antibodies are appearing. And one of the participants in this group brought up this theory. It's very fascinating, totally took me by surprise. And I wanted to share this with you. This theory basically will help you to explain, first of all, there's a surprise. First, first of all, based on the latest evidence of yet another study showing that IgG4 antibodies are on the rise post mRNA, mRNA shots, this paper gave additional clues that finally allows us for the first time to drop parallels between mRNA vaccination and the IgG4 related diseases because they do exist. They're, they're, they're being clinically studied obviously for a while now ever since their discovery and this finally allows us to drop parallels and this supports the theory. The, the, the surprising part of the theory is, is that part of the spike protein might be mimicking something that's present in our bodies and basically that could be the cause of the issue and as I already mentioned this mimicry might explain the cytokine storm production as well as why we're seeing these IgG4 antibodies. All right, before I get into the theory, let's talk about the paper because the paper is what stimulated the discussion. This is now the sixth paper that I'm aware of that has come out since 2022 that shows in humans from different geographical locations that those who take mRNA shots, they have this increase of IgG4 antibodies, especially after third booster. So, and there's one more in animal studies. Look, why haven't we seen this before? It's because this is obviously three years since mass vaccination program has started and three years have elapsed. And now we're finally seeing this effect three years later. When the vaccines were approved for, for mass use, Remember, these vaccines were produced in crazy record time. So fast, in fact, that it's probably, you could consider it as one of the greatest scientific achievements of humanity because of how fast it was developed. As a consequence of that, a lot of this information that we're learning now, long-term information, simply was not available to us. And on top of that, IgG4 antibodies are typically not monitored post-vaccination because they are not expected to be an issue. This is one of the reasons why this is such a surprise right now with regards to these mRNA shots. And then the big, big question is why mRNA shots only? So once again, this paper corroborated the previous findings that this is only happening post-mRNA shots. The reason why is because these authors, when they looked at 
use of AstraZeneca adenovirus based vector based vaccines there is once again no rise in these IgG4 antibodies so this is only happening in mRNA shot vaccinated and a specifically especially after third shot so this study what makes this study unique though is number one is that it's it had a very large number of participants over 600 and the second very unique component of the study was that they also looked at patients who were taking who took the vaccine but who were also taking immunosuppressive drugs and this is where we're learning really new interesting information so out of those 600 approximately 100 were healthy individuals without any diseases who took the three shots about 50 of them were vaccinated individuals that actually did report having some diseases so those are control groups and then they had four different groups of immunosuppressive uh, patients patients who were taking immunosuppressive drugs so the drugs that they were uh, they're taking uh, from memory so uh, look i could always be screwing this up but if i describe the name i always make sure i put the correct correct spelling afterwards so approximately just over 100 were people who were taking immunosuppressive drug called dupilumab i believe and this this particular drug it basically acts against a specific cytokine that immune cells produce called interleukin-4 okay so that's what this drug um, drug does so this will become important in a moment the second immunosuppressive drug oh sorry did i say that right um no it was about just over 50 individuals who took that that drug okay then over 100 individuals took a drug um, that was called let's see if I can remember MTX what did that stand for something like methoxine mm, I got I'm pretty sure I got the name wrong because <laughs> I kept trying to remember and I kept forgetting anyway that drug is a um, little bit different it's broader in that this drug what it does it prevents mm, production of chemicals that are would be involved in the in the production of dna so it really broadly would act in preventing cell division okay and the last type of immunosuppressive drugs they these authors used and this group was about just over two or almost 200 individuals was inhibitors of tumor necrosis factor cytokine and again it will come in important um, in a moment and the last group was a combination of that tumor necrosis fact factor inhibitors with the mtx inhibitors i'm not gonna remember what, what it's called so that's what i'm going to refer to it as from now on and what did these guys observed so they they were just like in all other vaccinations they saw the typical finding that hey when you take a vaccine you have the ri corresponding rise in antibodies in in the blood and as uh, they were looking specifically antibodies that were targeting spike protein re receptor binding domain and the receptor binding domain of the spike protein is the region of the of the spike protein that is involved in interaction with the ACE receptor which is how the virus gains entry into our cells by interacting via receptor binding domain with the ACE2 receptor that is found on, on the surface of our cells. Okay, so that's what they're looking at. So after first vaccination, you see a rise against uh, antibodies, against spike protein. Second, second vaccination increased that. Then after some time, there's a dip. And then a third vaccination re-increased the amount um, to what was seen before very typical pattern of what we've been seeing over the last few years and all the studies in terms of what happens with vaccination so that there is a waning process where the number of antibodies disappear and they get reboosted if you take a booster so they've seen that in all of these groups however once again they saw those individuals who took the three vaccines with in the control group so those individuals that were totally healthy or those that actually had some diseases 
but they did not take in any immunosuppressive drugs. After the third vaccine shot, there's a corresponding increase in the IgG4 antibodies in these individuals. And for the healthy individuals, the healthy group, that on average, the, or I should say median, was about 20% of all of the anti-spike antibodies were of the IgG4 subtype. And for the group that uh, had certain conditions, approximately 15, 1-5% was, was the median, um, where 15% of the antibodies targeting spike protein were of the IgG4 subtype. Now that's the median, the range was much broader, um, some of the individuals were even seeing as high as almost 80%, all right? And the lowest in that group was just few percent, which is what you would normally be expecting to see in an individual of, at any point. You should only have very small amount of this IgG4 antibody in your system. All right, but the surprising and the novel result is that individuals who took the immunosuppressive drugs, they had either very marked decrease in the production of the IgG4 antibodies, or they did not produce them at all, meaning that they were being protected. And uh, specifically, it was that antibody that they were uh, taking against interleukin-4 cytokine, so that antibody duplimobab, I believe, and I have no clue how, how they're even pronounced. So uh, it's, and that's just how I'm pronouncing it. So use of that, of that immunosuppressant completely prevented um, production of IgG4 antibodies in these individuals, and their, their median level was just around 1%. So very, very low, completely suppressed this. So new information, in that those individuals who were taking immunosuppressive drugs and took the vaccine, they, not, they, are, they will be protected from producing those IgG4 antibodies. Same, very similar results were, were observed with those inhibitors of tumor necrosis factor in cytokine. Once again, they did not provide the value of the median, but it was similar to what was observed with the immunosuppressive drug Duplimubab, and then finally the MTX. Oh, I wish I remember what it's called. Um, that one had only a weak suppression, and the median was about almost 7% of all of the anti spike antibodies were of the, of the IgG4 subtype. So it also did, so, did work against production of IgG4 antibodies, but not nowhere near to the same extent as, as, the, as the other two immunosuppressive uh, compounds. And then combination of tumor necrosis factors and the MTX compound, whatever it was, um, that had like intermediate effect. So the take home message is that individuals who took the immunosuppressive compounds appear that they will be protected against production of uh, these IgG4 antibodies. Now, this, what their authors were saying, okay, this is very important. First, this is first study of its kind that show that showed the effect of immunosuppressive compounds on the IgG4 production post the mRNA vaccinations. And they're saying perhaps we should even be considering these as a treatment in the IgG4 related diseases. They're saying that's not a surprise actually that these immunosuppressive compounds that target interleukin-4 are effective. And the reason why is because that cytokine is important in stimulation of the expansion of B cells and B cells will eventually, are the type of cells that eventually can be stimulated to produce antibodies and that interleukin-4 cytokine is especially important in the production of switching the B cells to the, towards the production of the IgG4 uh, ant um, antibodies. The tumor necrosis factor was a bit of a bigger surprise to them, so the authors were surprised that they were observing that result. But 
we're about to get to it as to why this this actually might not be a, a surprise and now we're finally going to go into the theory all right that that has been proposed by one of the scientists that i've been privileged to be able to um, listen to 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 some of his musings and of course i read the the blog post that where he ex they explained that that entire theory I can't remember the exact gender of the person, so I better say they. <laughs> and anyway, um, the point is, is this, that this outcome of this publication finally points towards similarities with IgG4-related diseases. So what do we know from IgG4-related diseases? These diseases are marked by massive expansion of B cells. That's one of the hallmark of these diseases. They're also marked by also these B cells when they expand, they don't produce many antibodies at all. They typically have very restricted repertoire of how many antibodies are being produced when these B cells are expanded massively in, in the individuals that have these diseases that are marked by very high levels of IgG4 antibodies just like what we're seeing in these mRNA vaccinated individuals right now. So that means there's only three to maybe five antibodies that are being produced by these massively expanded B cells. What else is being observed is that um, the, these individuals see massively expanded amount of CD4 plus cytotoxic T cells. What are these? These are helper T cells. These are the type of T cells that are typically the first ones to, to recognize problems in the body and they communicate this information to, to other immune cells. So they're, they're, hence their nickname, helper T cells, because they, they help to stimulate proper immune responses in order for us to start taking action against mm, the insult. All right, And they also have a massively expanded type of cells called follicular helper T cells. And specifically these type of T cells, they're a subcategory of, of the CD4 plus helper T cells, but subcategory that is specifically involved in stimulating B cells and expanding their production and stimulating them to start producing specific antibody responses. And this, all of this takes place in a very specific regions called germinal centers. So these follicular helper T cells are also paramount in the formation of these germinal centers. These germinal centers form in some of your um, lymph um, tissues and basically that's where you have a um, selection of B cells where B cells are selected to, hey, you're going to be producing these type of antibodies, antibodies against this type of pathogen. So that's how takes place in these germinal centers. All right, so this is what happens in, in individuals with, with the IgG4-related diseases where these diseases are marked by very high level of these IgG4 antibodies. What is also known, though, that you can take medications that will suppress the production of these B cells and immediately you have clinical response. So that means you have re reduction of clinical issues in these individuals who take this type of medication and you, so you have suppression of the, pro of the amount of B cells involved and you also have corresponding suppression of, um, of um, these helper T cells. However, no one actually knows really to, to appreciable degree what do these antibodies that the B cells produce in those IgG4 related diseases, what do these antibodies actually target? What is it that they're after? Now this has been studied to some limited degree in the past, but it ac actually goes to show you how little we still know about these diseases that this has really hasn't been studied to a great degree. And the author whose theory I'm going to be describing brought up this one study that was only conducted a few years ago where the authors of that study wanted to answer that very specific question. And they did pretty cool, cool work. What they did, they wanted to see, hey, these antibodies produced 
these IgG4 antibodies produced by these in sick individuals, what did it target? So what they did is they took one individual who had the IgG4-related disease and they isolated those B cells from that individual. And they separated these B cells individually. So they collected them one by one and they sequenced their genetics individually per single cell. And they did it for a number of different cells. So this is called um, um, single cell uh, genomics or sequencing. So you literally look at genetic information of a single individual cell and they did it for a number of cells. And what they were able to show is that in that particular individual, all of those B cells were responsible for producing five different type of antibodies. They were literally belong to five different families based on the genetics. That's it. So that entire expansion was, was responsible for producing just five different antibodies. And they decided to take the two biggest ones. So the two biggest pools of B cells were which basically accounted for 75% of all of the B cells that they studied. And because they already had the genetic information, they'd use that genetic information to produce this very same antibody that those B cells would be producing, but they produced it in a laboratory, so they had a large quantity of it. And they literally recreate those, recreated those, those specific antibodies so they could now use it in, in, in the lab. And now that they had this antibody, they decided to see what do these antibodies that we were able to basically get from these sick individuals, what do they target? And they started to expose basically human cell extracts. So they were taking certain cells, breaking them apart, and all the proteins were now being exposed to these antibodies. And they wanted to see, hey, what will these antibodies target? What will they attach to? And what they discovered is that predominantly the vast majority or the, the one protein that was being targeted by these antibodies from these IgG4 re related disease individual, they were targeting a protein called galactin-3. Now this is finally where we're getting into the key information supporting this theory that I want to tell you about, galactin-3. So let's obviously um, start unpacking that. So galact well, first of all, what is galactin-3? Galactin-3 is a very interesting protein that can bind sugar molecules on top of cell surfaces. Sugars are also can be called glycans, hence the name galactin. And there's a family of them, but galactin-3 is just one of them. So it can target sugar molecules on top of a on top of a surface uh, of a uh, surface of different cells. As a consequence, galactins can have very important biological roles. Number one, they can they can create a lattice. They can actually interact with themselves as well. So they can create lattice. So they can actually determine what kind of cells and when do cells can come into contact with one another via via grabbing those sugar molecules on the cell surface. As a consequence, if you do control which cells might be binding or interacting with one another, you will also control how these cells communicate with each other because cells talk to each other via chemicals all the time. It's all the time, non-talk non -talk chatter. It's like blah, blah, blah from one cell to blah, blah, blah to another cell. They talk all the time. But of course, you have to be in a proximity to in order to hear what the other cell is saying. And when the cells are in proximity, they can influence each other's behavior through how they gossip to, towards one another. All right. So this is what these galactin, galactins do. But this was only one individual. Um, the authors wanted to see, hey, we know galactins are important. And as a consequence, gal uh, galactins, too much galactin is known to be involved in many different diseases, including cancer, all right? So, and in fact, buildup of many proteins can be problem in cancer precisely because it can lead to stimulation of, of antibodies against the protein that is being presented too much to the body, all right? So these authors wanted to see, is this what we might be observing in other individuals, because this is based on a single individual that they discovered this. And what they did is they took a pool of 121 individuals that had the IgG4-related disease diagnosis, 
And that's an umbrella term. This, this encompasses many different types of diseases. Typically, when you think of IgG4 antibodies and IgG4-related diseases, generally you can think of autoimmune diseases. And what they discovered is that about 30% of those 120 individuals, in the, when, they, when they looked whether their antibodies that, they were pro, that these individuals are producing, those antibodies were also targeting galactin-3. So it happens to be a common problem. So as a consequence, what we're really talking about here is that individuals that have IgG4-related disease, they produce antibodies that target our own molecule. These are that means these are antibodies that that target ourselves. So that means galactin three is a auto antigen promoting antibodies that will attack ourselves. Such antibodies that attack ourselves are called or referred to as auto antibodies. Auto meaning of self. So these auto antibodies are attacking something that is present within ourselves. So the authors were concluding, hey, we're dealing with when you have this IgG4 related disease and you're producing these IgG4 antibodies, you are producing autoantibodies and at least portion of these IgG4 antibodies are autoantibodies and at least a portion of the increase of these IgG4 antibodies seen in those diseases are as a consequence of producing these autoantibodies against galactin-3. All right, so this is, this is the important revelation. Now, the authors studied this further. They also wanted to see, as I already mentioned, it is known from the past that galactin-4 can be involved in many diseases, including cancer, and that cancers can start producing autoantibodies against proteins that have that are accumulated in too much of a quantity so they also wanted to look hey do these individuals that produce these auto antibodies against galactin 4 do they happen to have too much of galactin 4 in in their blood and that's exactly what they're seeing so that means it is too much of the antigen too much of the galactin 4 that that is present in the blood that stimulates the production of these IgG4 antibodies against galactin-3 or these autoantibodies. And this is the key revelation that might help to explain why we might be seeing this in mRNA vaccinated individuals. Because the take-home message here is that, and this has been a suspicion for a while, that it is the too much presentation of a specific antigen that leads to the production of these autoantibodies that in, can include IgG4 antibodies. Now, IgG4, remember from the previous videos I've already made on this topic, they are referred to as anti inflammatory. The reason why is because they do not promote clearance of the target that they attach to. Normally, when, anti when you produce antibodies, you want those antibodies to attach to whatever is not desired in your body, and then subsequently, other immune cells were, will destroy that entire complex. IgG4s do, do not induce that destruction to the same level as other subtypes of, of antibodies. And as a consequence, they are referred to as anti-inflammatory because the process of the destruction of the complex, the antigen complex to the antibody, that can be inflammatory. And this is why IgG4 antibodies are referred to as anti-inflammatory. But the consequence of that is that they're, in essence, built something like a tolerance towards whatever is the insult. So in this case, in the mRNA vaccinated individuals, IgG4 antibodies could be building something akin to tolerance towards the spike protein because that's the type of IgG4 antibodies we're seeing. But we are still about to connect it all together, so stay with me. So we already know this, right? So as a consequence, these antibodies, they, they have a different, different purpose, right? They literally want to mask 
something that is that otherwise is causing too much problem. And the authors wanted to show, hey, if we take these individuals who have these too much galactin, galactin-3 in their blood, and as a consequence, they produce too much of these IgG4 antibodies and we um, against galactin-3, those autoantibodies, and we treat them with a drug that removes the B cells and therefore removes the cells that are responsible for production of the IgG4 antibodies, what do we see? And the drug they, they use, of, I'm not gonna remember the drug because too many names. Mm. I think it was called something like rituximab. It's, we've already talked about this in one of our videos dedicated to how to help mRNA vaccinated individuals. It's precisely the same drug and this drug was provided <laughs> Normally, I have a wind issues, <laughs> but right now it's a crying baby issue. Oh. Anyway, they provided this drug to these individuals and what they were able to see is that this drug indeed helped these individuals. It did reduce the level of IgG4 antibodies targeting galactin-3 and improve, improve their, um, their clinical symptoms. But here is a weird twist to all of this that might be responsible for once you produce IgG4 antibodies against collectin-3, such a production might stimulate these antibodies to produce more of themselves. So there's this bizarre twist and why we might be seeing so many of these antibodies being produced specifically if galactin-3 is a target. And the reason why is because while I mentioned galactin-3 um, is involved in, uh, in cell interaction, it, galactin-3 is also involved in helping B cells mature. It, uh, it, it is responsible in stimulating immune cells that release this interleukin-4. So this is really, the, by the way, this is the correlation with the study we saw in the mRNA vaccinated individuals. And it is also responsible for stimulating these cells during the cytokine storm to, to, to produce, and when it stimulates the immune cells, it might also help these cells stimulate the production of tumor necrosis factor. So again, we've seen this in, in, that, in, in that study with mRNA vaccinated individuals. Together, all of that is important in the maturation of B cells, all right? So this is how galactin, too much galactin might be stimulating B cells. But galactin-3 also does something else. It appears to be involved in the proper regulation of these germinal centers where the B cells are being stimulated. And here's the weird twist. If you remove galactin-3, if you just completely get rid of it, these germinal centers are no longer properly controlled and they spontaneously appear and they, when the galactin-3 is removed, they, these germinal centers spontaneously appear and enhance the production of autoantibodies, at least in animal models. So galactin-3 is responsible for stimulating B cells, but also properly controlling the proper function of these germinal centers. What that means is that those individuals that have IgG4 related disease, that they produce autoantibodies, IgG4 autoantibodies against galactin-3, well, that might have actually removed some of the galactin-3 that was responsible for proper control of these germinal centers where the B cells are being stimulated into producing specific antibodies. And now they're out of whack, they're not properly controlled, and then that's how you might end up in even greater increase in the production of these IgG4 antibodies. All right, so this, all of this might help to explain what we're seeing in the IgG4 related diseases. But obviously, how is this related now to the mRNA vaccines and the spike protein? Because obviously when you take mRNA shot, what you're doing is you're taking genetic information on, on how to produce the spike protein. So how is all of this related together? All right, well, 
and here comes the big surprise and and how this particular author was was explaining this but this is nothing new actually and it comes it's the information that spike protein actually has in one of its regions actually has a a groove or a pocket that very closely resembles galactin 3 super close this is in a in a region of the spike protein called c uh, n terminal domain i almost got that one n terminal domain so remember spike protein has two subunits s1 which is the head of the spike protein and s2 which is the stock of this of the spike protein and recall from one of my videos what has to happen with the spike protein the head has to be ripped off so the head contacts the receptors on the cell surface of our cells and then the head is ripped off and this is finally when the stock is exposed and the stock the s2 subunit it has these two little mm, alien arms that will then expand grab the adjacent cell and will bring that cell to the virus and that's how the virus that had the spike protein on its surface will fuse with the cell that it wants to invade but the s1 subunit still remains attached to the receptor via which the virus bound and it still has that end terminal domain exposed so that means it has that pocket that looks like galactin galactin 3. now this pocket is known in the spike protein is already known to bind to different sugars just like galactin 3. i in fact made a video on this topic a long time ago where i discussed how virus uses these crazy tricks by interacting with sugar molecules and the video was on the topic of one of the authors that showed that this is how the virus might be interacting with sugar molecules on the cell surface and this is how it might help the virus invade the, the cell because it attaches to the sugar molecules on the surface it waits it waits until the receptors comes in, co comes into contact and boom then the spike protein via its receptor binding domain which is very close to that end terminal domain which binds the sugar molecules will attach to the receptor on the cell surface such as ace2 receptor and voila you have that head ripped off but once the head is ripped off the spike protein on the virus could do its function which is to invade the cell but remember the spike protein fragment can still remain on the cell on, on the surface of the cell via being bound to the receptor or it could come off and then it fl could float around including float in the circulation but it still has that pocket that resembles galactin and it could still interact with sugars and this is what has been previously proposed what might have been causing cytokine storms in in the unvaccinated individuals who were infected by the virus because we and we have already known that one of the predisposing factors for severe COVID-19 was also if you had too much galactin-3 in your blood. So that's one predisposing factor for severe, severe cytokine storm. But another one was perhaps the spike protein itself could be producing the, the cytokine storm. Why? Because that fragment of the spike protein, this N-terminal domain found in the S1 subunit of the spike protein, it's known to produce the same cytokines by immune cells that it interacts with as galactin-3. So that means it can stimulate immune cells the same way that galactin-3 can. Spike protein could be stimulating in the same fashion immune cells and this is how you could produce this excessive cytokine storm what we were seeing at the start of the pandemic. All right, so that's the crazy connection. But here, how does it now relate to, of course, the mRNA vaccinated individuals that are now producing IgG4 antibodies? Well, here's the thing. Because spike protein, it might be coming down to the same cause that we're seeing in the, in the individuals that have the IgG4-related diseases they're producing these IgG4 antibodies that are autoantibodies attacking our own self because of the fact that too much specific antigen was being presented. 
in, in the case of those diseases, one of those antigens that was presented too much was galactin-3. Well, here we could be seeing something similar in that instead of galactin-3 though, it might be something that is related to galactin-3 and it's a subcomponent of the spike protein. It's being because of the mRNA shots presented so much of it, that might be the reason why it stimulated the production of the IgG4 antibodies and you had that chain reaction that we similarly might have seen, especially if the IgG4 antibodies produced in the mRNA vaccinated individuals might be targeting galactin-3. Why? Because if it might be targeting galactin-3 as well, and we don't know if it does, that's something we, we should probably start looking into, it could also be responsible for putting those germinal centers out of control and over -pro stimulating overproduction of IgG4 antibodies. So that's how you connect this together. Where we don't have answers to is obviously, number one, do these IgG4 antibodies seen in the mRNA vaccinated individuals, and now this is all over the world, because the paper, for example, that I discussed at the very start of the of this video, those that was done, those studies were done in Netherlands. We've seen this now all over the world. So this is not a localized to one geographical location. We're seeing this in mRNA vaccinated individuals all over the world. So we need to know do these do these IgG4 antibodies, are these autoantibodies? Can these antibodies attack anything in our own self? Specifically, do, could they be targeting galactin-3? That's one unanswered question. If they were to be targeting galactin-3, are these IgG4 antibodies as a consequence affecting germinal center production, which is why you might be seeing overproduction of these IgG4 antibodies? So that's, that's another question. And the final question, and then was whether there this might be a reaction that is similar in IgG4-related disease individuals. And one thing I didn't mention is that galactin-3, not only does it stimulate the immune cells and trigger B cell maturation into eventual production of antibodies, these galactin-3s have another, another potential dire consequence if you have too many of them. And the reason why is because these galactin-3s, they are also responsible for stimulating cells such as th that are called fibroblasts. And these fibroblasts, those are the type of cells that are involved in the production of scar tissue. They have other roles, obviously. They, they produce connective tissue, but in a, under specific circumstances, they are also used for production of, the, of scar tissue. And that's one of the questions that the authors of this study that looked into what kind of what do these IgG4 antibodies target in these in these um, individuals with IgG4 related diseases they were wondering is this a response to too much galactin 3 a response to protect the body from pr from too much fibrosis taking place and fibrosis is basically a name for building a scar tissue and the reason why that is dangerous is because if you produce too much scar tissue on on your organs eventually this will be detrimental to the proper function of that organ so you do not want to be seeing this this is one of the reasons why myocarditis is also potentially dangerous and it's not a trivial experience to have so they were proposing hey maybe igg4 antibodies in these individuals that have that disease with too much galactin-3 in their blood is natural protection of the body against too much scar tissue development on, on the organs, but as an unfortunate consequence of that attempted protection, you might be dysregulating those germinal centers and you might be overproducing IgG4 antibodies and you end up with a disease. So it leads to a certain pathology. And so that also remains an answer question. Could something similar be happening post mRNA vaccination in that because part of the spike protein resembles galactin-3, could it be accidentally inducing 
too much scar tissue development and hence this is our body's way of protecting the body from overbuilding the scar tissue around certain organs. Another unanswered question, um, still in either IgG4 related diseases or mRNA vaccinated, but here you see how convoluted this can be and how interesting it can be when a one specific individual starts putting the dots together into really, really interesting, complicated scientific theory. This also explains why we cannot stifle sharing scientific theories, whether they're correct or not. We don't know if this is true, what I'm telling you about. I'm just telling you that, that this has been already observed and as a consequence, early on in a pandemic, there's been calls in the scientific literature that perhaps we should be inhibiting galactin-3 as a way of treating against COVID-19. So much so that um, even the video I made on over a year ago on that very same pocket of, of spike protein, those authors were also showing what kind of inhibitors could be binding in that pocket. Ironically, those were inhibitors that we as a society decided to make fun of and we chose not to use them against COVID-19. So watch that video to find out what it was. It, it, it's a surprise. But the call for treatment of COVID-19 by targeting galactin trees was very early on in the pandemic and this is still something we have to figure out whether this theory is true or not and whether the spike protein might be inducing one of its harmful effects is because it part of it mimics galactin-3 and it, it does result in biological processes that mimic galactin-3 and therefore it dysregulates what should be happening in our body. And that dysregul like, dysregulation could be overactivation of the immune cells, which is how you might have been seeing cytokine storm early on in the pandemic, potentially also dysregulation of the proper function of those germinal centers, which is where you have overproduction of B cells and there eventually overproduction of IgG4 antibodies and, and, uh, and finally potentially overstimulation of the process of fibrosis, which is the development of scar tissue. All of that we still have to figure out because those are unanswered questions questions but this is a very fascinating theory that I wanted to share with you that start potentially start giving us clues and as I already mentioned the authors of the very first paper I presented of they also suggested that these immunosuppressive compounds that they were using could be potentially considered as a treatment modality in the IgG4 related diseases as well. One of them has already been used to some degree with mixed results, so these are still controversial. We don't know, we simply have to start looking. But we do know now more and more frequently, as I mentioned, it's now the six, six, five plus one, six paper where we see that has shown that only in mRNA vaccinated individuals, we see these IgG4 antibodies as I already mentioned, these IgG4 antibodies, if you actually want to understand what do they do, they're quite mysterious. If you're trying to discover what they do, typically you can link their function with development of autoimmune diseases or cancer. So we're going to, I'm going to make another video how these IgG4 antibodies could be promoting cancer development. So stay tuned for, for, for that. And because of these potential harmful effects, we need to also be on top of it on how to prevent this because it could be a very, very simple and easy solution. Hence, we need to pay attention to this. All right, I warned you this is going to be a super long video. And um, <laughs> well, now it's time to end it. I just want to say thank you for staying with me for this long and uh, thank you for your support. If you like this video, look, these videos are never this long. This is one of my longest ones. But please subscribe to the channel. This is the type of science I bring, bring to you. And um, then this you'll get more this this type of information. Also, check out our Patreon account. This is the channel where we toss in even more controversial theories 
sometimes not necessarily backed by much evidence. Hence, we want to have a venue where we don't have to be necessarily penalized by what we want to talk about, whether it's correct or not. Science is normal to introduce incorrect theories. That's how science is supposed to operate. You introduce theories because everything in science, everything is made on assumptions. Some of these assumptions, eventually you build up evidence so that an assumption can become over time a fact, but even when you have factual information underneath that, you still have assumptions and sometimes these assumptions turn out to be incorrect. So that means in science, you have to be always open-minded to bring new theories, new ideas, precisely so that if there is a problem, we have proper, proper venue for brainstorming into how to solve this problem. And this is exactly what I'm trying to achieve with these videos related to IgG4 antibodies that are seen post mRNA vaccinations. All right, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And I'll see you in a future installment of another one of these videos. Bye, everyone.